Hi everybody, it's Jared Goff from Miss You Scotland with another We Are Mission podcast and I am delighted to be joined by Sister Placida McCann who is a Franciscan sister of the Immaculate Conception. Sister, thank you very much for taking time out to speak to us today. You're welcome, Jared. So Sister, um, as we do with everyone, if you just tell us a wee bit about your your background, your family and and things like that, just to kick us off. Oh, okay. Um, Well, um... I'm a native of Greenock. I was mm-hmm. born in St Andrews Parish, Blackfield, and I uh, went to St Andrews Primary School. I went to St Columba's Secondary School, and then somehow I, um, I went from the school straight to the convent. Don't ask me why, but maybe tell you that later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I was active in the parish, um, the Legion of Mary, and used to go to the charismatic prayer groups Mm -hmm. but also at the same time I would be involved with the guides and the youth club and I was well into sports you know I used to play hockey for the school team volleyball for the school team and football I used to play in a wee team for the the senior youth club we used to go around and play other girls teams and uh, good good be time there with that it was smashing and uh, I'm from a big family and I've had a very good and enjoyable young life let me say Mm -hmm. so much so that I think that's maybe why I I decided I might want to be a sister because I felt that I was so blessed in my family and my friends and I just felt I could maybe do something for God back (laughs) but that's a bit strange but that's really the way I felt at the time but I never ever wanted to be a sister so but anyway that's that's my background anyway my parents were uh, all traditional Catholics and um, practicing and all that, and my relatives as well. Mm-hmm. So, was it anything in particular you, you excelled at at school? Um, sp- sports. Well, sports. I'm not excelled. I played. I played for the county for hockey, mm-hmm. and we got to the semi final of the Scottish Cup in the volleyball. <laughs> wow. So, apart from that, I'm not. Oh, I was on a television one time. Um, you know that we are the champions. Yeah, yeah. Well, they came to our school and I get picked to be in it. And uh, we honestly, a whole lot of us were rubbish at the field events, but we were good at the swimming. I like swimming as well, but I didn't ever do a, like in a club or that, but mm. we, we did okay. But we get, it was um, something, Kirk and Tillock, I forget the name of the school, but a school in Kirk, Kirk and Tillock, and they, they, they beat us. So I don't tell many people about that. <laughs> <laughs> and so how, how um, what was the family like? How many of them are you? Oh, I'm the oldest of seven. Wow. But when I went to the convent, we were only six. Mm-hmm. So when I was in the convent, I was professed. My mother had another baby to replace me. <laughs> we <laughs> called her Claire Francis. <laughs> so, uh, oh, that, that was really just a wee, a wee bonus. And she turned out to be a, a lovely wee girl and she's married with three children now. Mm-hmm. So, so, uh, so how many brothers and sisters? Two, two brothers and two brothers. four sisters. And for sister, what do they do with themselves? Okay, Teresa works in Lidl. Mm-hmm. Um, James is a manager in the Royal Bank of Scotland. And Anne Marie's, a, 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 I don't know what she does exactly, but she's in the Royal Bank of Scotland, uh, mm-hmm. works in the mortgage centre. And Pauline is an accountant who works in the school, uh, the primary school now, just doing the, the secretary job because mm-hmm. she wanted to be near her children. Sure. when they were grown up and she likes it so she's still there and Pauline and Marie Pauline um, Bernard is disabled he's got cerebral palsy and he's a character <laughs> if he wasn't uh, disabled he would probably be a bishop by now <laughs> he's a holy <laughs> dope he always watches mass online about four or five times a day and the divine mercy and the rosary so he's a bit strange but anyway <laughs> no he's a, he's a good lad he, I don't know if you've met him but he's a character I've, I've so definitely that, heard uh, you talking about him before, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, he's, he's a big part of our family, yeah. <laughs> and Claire is a pharmacist, works in boots. Wow, so I take it you're an, an, an auntie many times over then? Many of us count them, actually. <laughs> a great auntie as well for some of the ones. So it's a, a costly experience for you at Christmas and Easter and things like that? Well, no, I just pull the religious card and just oh, say, okay. well, come on, I have to have our poverty. <laughs> so I, I just buy them a big bag of sweeties and let them share it. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, tell a lie. I do get them. Like I got rosary beads and um, a wee cross for my niece and my nephew who are going to make their first communion, the confirmation. Oh. So they were quite chuffed with that. 
Great so. stuff. So, I mean, mm-hmm. it, it's, it's quite obvious that Faith uh, has played a big part in your life from a young age and, and obviously sure. continues to do so in the rest of your family and stuff like that. When you were talking about some of the, the groups that you got involved with, was that just organic? Or was it just something that came natural? Yeah, I, I just like being among people and I'm interested in different things, you know. I, I, I'm a social animal, mm-hmm. as they say, and uh, I, I just like... I like being in the Legion and my pals at school used to say, what did you do in that Legion? And I was like, well, I visit old folk and sick folk and it's just like, it's a nice feeling. It gives you a nice feeling. Mm-hmm. They thought I was bonkers. But then when I told them I was going to be a nun, they thought I was even more bonkers. <laughs> anyway, um, it was just a matter of, 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 of the best of both worlds. I would be going to the discos with the youth club discos and I'd be going to the Legion. And I, got more, I think I get more enjoyment out of the Legion than I did dancing about the Bay City Rollers, which we all totally loved. <laughs> uh, was that your favourites, were they? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I never got to see them live. I went to see Queen live in concert, but I never, ever went to the Bay City Rollers. I don't know why. Maybe we didn't want to be disappointed if they weren't the good live music, you know. But anyway, <laughs> somebody said they were rubbish. But Queen were brilliant live, absolutely brilliant. Right. Magic. So if we, if we talk mm-hmm. a wee bit, uh, move on to talking about your vocation, as you just kind of mentioned there. Was it Anyone or anything that was the kind of catalyst for your, your decision to take up a vacation? Was it MD? It was a major influence? Well, I, I'd say it was a, a mixture of, of different um, events and people. My Auntie Bridie, God rest her, she died like two years ago there, and um, a year and a half. She uh, was in the Legion Mary, and when I was a wee girl, she used to come in and talk about her Legion work and talk about it. And mm-hmm. I used to say, What's this Legion? And I was interested, and it was through her example, I think, that I, I joined it. And, she was my confirmation sponsor and all that. And it really, she did play a big part in my religious formation. And of course, my parents, my dad used to take us to confession once a month. And um, we used to hate going, but we went anyway. But it was just the fact that we believed in it. Like mom and daddy would kneel down at night. We, we lived in a two bedroom house. We were six kids at the time. And Granda was staying with us and a dog called Whiskey. <laughs> and here was I. And all squished in, squeezed into these rooms. Mum and Daddy had to sleep in the living room and I pulled down bed. And the cot, the baby's cot was in the bed in the, the sitting room. Huh. So it, we were like living like tankers. <laughs> we were no, I don't even know how you describe it, but anyway. So um we would uh, come in at night from a night out and that and mum and daddy were kneeling down saying their prayers. Mm-hmm. And that was like really touching to me. Because I would just jump into bed and see my prayers lying down, you know, because I was going to get out in the cold because it was quite cold. We didn't have high central heating. I mean, this sounds as if we were third world people. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody was the same in those days. Mm-hmm. Nobody had a phone. Nobody had a car. I'm not that old, by the way. But I mean, it was just, that's the way it was and we accepted it. So um, the good example from my parents, I think. And then later on, uh, the school, Sister Louise, McGlone, she was she's our mother general now. She was in my school. She was a teacher. Mm-hmm. I never got her because she was geography and I was history. But anyway, she would uh, invite us up sometimes to go for these vocations talks. Right. I didn't really want to go, but I went because my pal Ellen wanted to go, and I got roped into that. And then when I went, I actually found it was interested, mm-hmm. and uh, it was a, a strange thing because Ellen said she didn't want to be a sister, and I said, well, I think I do. And everybody was kind of thinking I was at it, you know, and saying, you're just making that up for all, you're giving us a laugh, you know, and I says, no, I'm serious, I'm quite frightened actually, this is serious. So the next thing I was roped in, roped in by, by just being attracted to it, mm-hmm. to go and see more about it. And that's, I thought I would just go maybe stay a few months and come away again. Mm-hmm. But that was me for over 40 something years now and Jeez. I've never regretted it. Um, did you- was there any kind of surprises that came up when you decided to follow your vocation? Um, well, just the fact that I, I, I liked it, you know, the fact that I, I, I stayed. Like, the, the guy next door bet me a fiver. I wouldn't last more than, than six months. So <laughs> I thought, I'll, I'll, I'll wait six months and get the fiver, and then I'll leave. That's a bit more or less what I was thinking. <laughs> but when I, when I went in, I actually, I, I just felt so in the right place and I really got a lot of joy or something I just felt it was it was something um that I was supposed to be doing and I felt 
I'm in the right place and I've never I've been all over the world I mean they've sent me all over the world and I've, I've had every kind of experience you can imagine and I've really never regretted joining never that's really strange because usually you regret something but it's mm. not been easy ups and downs but I've never really said oh I wish I could just leave now you know no it's it's been the right place for me Thank magic you. I mean if, if you were have to, if you had to dis- define what vocation means that would was it mean in a broader sense how, how would you def, how would you define it i just feel it's um, god's call to every single person and um, vocation like it uh, means call right so i mean that call is for everybody to come to know him um as a personal friend and to be able to put him, put him in their life so that their life becomes a, a meaningful existence and that they as as kind of like believers would be able to share the, the the faith and the joy and the love that they have with others and spread that goodness to transform the the, the selfishness of the world you know because the world to me is is basically what's wrong with it's just selfishness nothing, nothing more nothing less people are selfish and all of us are selfish in a way but we've got to fight it so my belief is that God comes into that selfishness and lets you see that you can help other people to be happy. And at the same time, I, it's amazing you, how happy you are by helping others. And that's what I learned early when I used to visit the sick with the old, and the old people with the legion. I, I found joy, a real great joy, you know. It was mm-hmm. weird. Couldn't explain it really. It's just something inside you that you feel, wow, this is yeah. amazing. <laughs> And that's something that's stuck with you, you know, all through oh, your... Oh, definitely, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and in terms of the, the Franciscan sisters, what, what made you choose them as a, a, a congregation? To be honest, I didn't really choose. I had a pal that went to be a sister shooting around all these convents if she was going to the supermarket sweep and choosing, you know, like <laughs> saying, I don't like that one, I don't like that one, I like that one. But I never, I just was, was led through Sister Louise and then a wee sister, Mary Frances, she's dead now. She was a lovely wee sister who was the vocations directress and she would always welcome us and she was lovely. And uh, Louise would bring us up to the convent weekends, and it was never a, 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 an option. It was just that was where I was led, and that's the only reason. Plus, I'm a Scottish nationalist, of course, and not that I'm an SNP, but I really want, I would like to see Scotland independent, and I love Scotland so much. But mm-hmm. I thought, I, I, I'm, I'm being called to the right one because it's a Scottish congregation. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not supposed to be like that as a Franciscan, but I just have to be truthful, eh? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And what about, like, is there a saint or a scripture passage or both that, that defines or inspires a vocation? Well, Fran- Francis, um, his life story really touched me because I didn't really know much about him before. I mean, I knew he was a saint and he would like the flowers and the birds and all that, but I just um, learned about him when I, when I joined and I was so touched by the fact that he was a bit of a wild boy. I'm not saying, yeah. I'm not saying I was a wild girl, but I wasn't like your typical candidate for the, the sisterhood. I was a wee bit kind of like, I liked, to li- I liked life and I enjoyed my life. So when I thought of how could I be a sister and the way I'm crazy, like, I, I just felt... Oh, it's hope. Francis can do it. I can do it. <laughs> so he gave me a lot of encouragement there. And the way he really made true friends for the poor, he wasn't just condescending and giving them stuff. He he get right down there and get his hands dirty, helping them and touching the lepers and all that. Not that I've ever touched a leper, so don't think I'm saying that I'm a leper. I'm, I'm holier. I'm really... <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't want to yeah. sound like I'm like St. Francis, but he did inspire me, and I'd like to be like that one day. And also, um, that scripture it says it's not the the healthy that need a doctor; it's the sick. That really touched me a lot because when you become a sister, you feel with all these doubts. Like I'm not good enough. I'm not holy enough to become a sister. But in fact, it's the ones that are weak in the eyes of the world that God uses to confound the strong as the scripture says as well. So those mm-hmm. those passages really touched me. Mm-hmm. And, and, and just in a kind of wider sense, where do you draw strength from in terms of your, your vocation? Well, obviously, um, I, I think Holy Communion, uh, going to Mass every day and, and getting Holy Communion um, gives me a lot of, of um, strength. And also 
people people give me strength and energy um just ex an example of the older sisters um good people good lay people that i've been friends with over the years and my, my own friends and, and good people that i've, I've met over the, the the time i just feel they encourage me they energize me and they give me good examples so i just try to kind of follow that you know <laughs> mm -hmm. absolutely so um <clears throat> Where has your vocation taken you since you were um, professed and things like that? Oh, my goodness. Um, well, it started in Bodwell, uh, mm -hmm. the Then from Bodwell went to to where? Um, to, close, no, to, to Postle Park, you know, Lamb Hill, for two years while I was at college and another year oh. at Clyde. So I was at Craig Lockett College for the three-year course. And then after that, I was sent to Pennsylvania, to wow. Altoona for three years and then Bedford, historic Bedford in Pennsylvania for four years. And then after that, I was sent to the bush up in Kenya, in Kenya up in the, the mountains in the middle of nowhere um, for 10 years. And I, I loved that so much. I loved the other places, but I loved being in the bush. I really liked that because I used to be in the guide, remember? And I used to love yeah. camping. So yeah. that was just like camping um, for 10 years. Um, then I was 20 years in Kiricho. And hopefully one day I'll, I'll get back to Kenya, but who, who knows? God, God knows that. Um, and now I'm in Rome. Right, magic. Um, I mean, Pennsylvania, what, what was the three years there like? What, what did that entail? Oh, it was interesting, all right. Um, in, in Altoona, it was an Italian parish. You know, in America, mm -hmm. all the parishes are kind of got a, a, a nationality <laughs> attached to them. I yeah. never realised that before, but uh, we were Italians, so it was a preparation for coming to Rome, I think. But we met, made friends with all these Italians and used to have us to their house and give us pizzas and pasta. But um, <laughs> it was, I was in a a primary school, a, what they call a elementary school right. and a middle school and I enjoyed that, it was good we used to go to school trips to the theme parks and go on the Big Dippers and all nice. that, <laughs> oh, it was great and one time, oh no, and then when I moved to Bedford, I got to coach soccer, we call it soccer, right so I coached, yeah. coached football and that was my dream so <laughs> I had a wee team, a lovely wee team, a couple of wee teams because I did it over a few years and then Again, uh, the priest, when we were leaving, gave us um, a weekend, his holiday home in South Carolina for a, as a gift, for a thank you for the work we did for him. And the next thing, um, we went and had a great holiday. And a girl in Pizza Hut said to me, after we'd been to the beach in the morning, we went to play crazy golf, we went to see Dead Poets Society, and then we went for pizza. And Pizza Hut lady said to me, what's it like being a nurse? It's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> So we had a good time, but I wasn't crying when I left. I, mean, I was asked to go to Kenya. I was just mm. a bit worried about how I would cope in Kenya. But um, yes, so so you know, let's move on to that. Um, so you're sent to Kenya, and Kenya's obviously played a massive part of your life in your life. Sort oh, of thing. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. that's thirty odd years of it spent there and stuff like that. So what was the what was the first impressions like? I mean, how were you received when you went there? Well, to be honest, um, it was when I arrived, I just felt, this is Africa. I can't keep pinching myself. I said, this is me in Africa. I never thought I would come to Africa. Um, and I've always heard that Africa was like kind of like underdeveloped and, and all that. And um, it was uh, like jungle. I thought it was going to be like jungle or something. I don't know what I thought. But anyway, I don't go into Google much, by the way, before I go somewhere. But I honestly got a shock. And Nairobi was like any other modern city. Right, it was just like amazing. Um, so then, when we got up country, I saw what I was expecting was <laughs> the middle of nowhere, no else, yeah. just, you know, water, and it was a challenge, all right, but it was so exciting, and the people were amazing. Um, I'll tell you why. Um, I think I felt so close to those people in the first place I was in. It was called Kasok. Um, we lost two of our sisters in a car crash. Uh, the Jeez. very first year we were there, 1991, a young one, Sister Maximilian uh, from Glasgow, she's 28, and Sister Clement, who was 63, she was from um, Muddle Diocese, I'll, I'll remember the name of the place later, but I can't remember exactly, but anyway, she um, was an art teacher, and Sister Max was a maths teacher, and uh, they just went down to Nairobi, and on the way back they were killed, so that was a challenge. But I was left on my own 
but I wasn't on my own because the people rallied around and they became like my family and I never felt like all like a loss of it I just felt sad that they died but I felt I had a support and that's never changed ever since I mean, I mean certainly the the few times that I've been in Africa I've always found them like you know the Scots have always got a reputation for being very welcoming and hospitable and I find that uh, is replicated anywhere I've been in Africa is that something that you you felt then through that oh yeah yeah, definitely. I felt at home, you know, like I would get into the wee houses and they wouldn't have a chair, they would just have the bed. So you just sit in the bed and maybe a person was sitting in the bed, you'd sit in the bed and you wouldn't feel awkward. You'd sit in a wee tiny stool, it was a way down to the, the ground, it wasn't even like your legs would be halfway up your head. <laughs> Excuse me, you would be feeling a bit kind of like you were you were contortionist trying to sit down, but it wasn't uncomfortable. That was my point, is that you just felt you were in somebody's house that you knew for ages yeah. and maybe you'd only met them a couple of times or first time meeting them, but they just welcomed you right in and they sent next door to the next house to get a soda, you know, a, a Coca-Cola or something mm. to give you because they maybe not had anything in their house. I mean, it's, it was just a humbling experience for me anyway. I loved it. And, and that 10 years in the, the bush, what are some of the, the things that you and your, your fellow sisters did for the people? Got up to. Well, okay, yeah. well, the, the main um, thing was there was a terrible, um, always every year there was a dry season, terrible drought, and we not having water. We just had a big tank. So we used to watch it going down. We'd feel it going down every day, going down, no rain, no rain, no rain. And then it got down to maybe a few inches. We used praying all the time for rain, remember? So praying, 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 get down to a few inches. And the next thing, the rain would come on and we'd go out and dance in the rain. I remember it's as clear as if it was yesterday. And one of the sisters, she's dead now, Sister Martina from Greenock, she was a great old soul. She was young, younger then, but she was um, out dancing as well. And uh, the two of us and um, the, this other sister that came out today was, we were just dancing around the thing like it was as if it was like a totem pole. And, we <laughs> the and then we would sit outside and peel potatoes and the natives would be walking past looking at us what are they doing sitting outside doing their work because they never realized that it was for us it was a great thing to be able to be outside mm -hmm. so that was that and then the school was great there was a, a girls school when we took over the girls were really poor at english you know they, they they didn't have much english and they were expected to set exams so we worked hard with them and tried to get them uh, to pass so i've never been so happy somebody to get a d in my life but a d was a pass so right. at least they were, they were getting Fs before and now we got them to get a D. We were like, yes, result. <laughs> so that was a great thing. And I got took the girl guides there as well. Yeah. I had a wee troop and I had a wee uniform and we used to go camping, but we couldn't use a tent because of the snakes. So Oof. that was interesting. And then <laughs> I remember we went down to this place and honest to God, it was just like um, a, a army barracks. It was wooden huts lifted up off the ground on stilts mm -hmm. and that's where we slept and it was great fun absolutely brilliant fun but uh, different from any camping I've ever done before you know <laughs> absolutely uh, yeah. so like you you, you played a, a kind of big part in education then in the in the, in the bush in those 10 years yeah we were t I was teaching the whole time but we would also go down um, to do youth work down in the outstations and stay overnight right. and sleep rough and it was it was like again an adventure a real adventure where the people would welcome us into their homes and yeah. we would just sleep on a two of us would share a wee single bed that was like two bits of stick with tires for a mattress like tire bits of tire like rubber that made into a bed and we would be sleeping and you would fall down halfway through the night if you moved the wrong way you would fall down in the middle of it <laughs> to wake yourself up and fix it but um it was great it was and we'd sing around the campfire and they would teach us the local songs and uh we had just a great time and the priests were good there as well they were awful good um they would come down and say mass and we would with the youth learning the songs and singing through the choir and all that and uh, it was just it was a, a different totally different experience from anything I've ever experienced so I think I really just loved it. Magic um and we move on to the, the 20 years spent in, in Caricho and obviously this is something that uh, through Missio we've detailed in the past so tell us a wee bit about a very special project that you and your fellow sisters set up there. 
Okay, well, according to myself, they're all important. Uh, all okay, of course. Project, but I mean, I can't uh, say that I don't have a favourite because when my brother had been disabled then, and he's a patron of that wee club, he tries to sell raffle tickets and fundraise for it. But um, the, the, it used to be called the Little Angels Support Groups for the parents um, of the children to come together and see how we can help their kids. But we changed the name because some of the kids are not like if, if to me if they're mentally ill they would be little angels right because yeah. there's nothing they can do wrong but these were kids who just were not able to walk and they could commit sins like you or I so to call them little angels was a wee bit of a misnomer so I um, asked somebody it was a sister that came out I says can you think of a name that's got L-A-S-G because I needed that because it was on the bank but then he wanted to change the bank account <laughs> Yeah. So it was Franciscan Sisters LASG account. So I said, can you think of a name that would suit the disabled children? And she said, limited ability, special gifts. Isn't that lovely? That's really she good. Said, oh, yeah. A lovely name, but it's an awful mouthful. So we still call them little angels. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but technically that's the name we registered them under. And we tried to raise awareness. They were just ignored before and the parents so there was a, a, a stigma a, a, as if they had a stigma mm -hmm. and because they had a, a disabled child so they hid them and locked them in the houses and I think the benefit of that project is that we've been able to bring them into the to the light and let people see that they're gifts from God and they'll bring their own blessings like Bernard a blessing to us I used to always give witness to that when I was telling them stuff so and I'd show them pictures of him and how he was happy and all that so we've had a, a, a bit of success with that. And thanks to Missio for that funding. He gave us a few uh, uh, rounds of funding and it's really helped, you know. Yeah. And what, what, um, is, that's a fantastic project. What, what other things have you been involved with in, in Creature? Well, we had um, a couple from Mogai who gave us a donation to build a transitional care and training centre for the kids that are in the community with HIV and were being neglected and they were well, more or less dying because they weren't getting the right nutrition and they weren't getting their medicine on time or they weren't getting the medicine at all so we were able to open our centre which is a real big success because it's the only one of its kind in the South Rift Valley in fact I don't even know if there is there's some in Nairobi yeah but anyway it's very rare to see a, a place like that where it's not an orphanage it's a place we take them for some months and we send them to the local school so they don't miss school mm -hmm. but we teach them about their status we teach them about um taking their medicine uh, on time and how important it is and we give them good food and we make sure that they've got counseling to deal with their their um status and we also teach them about being responsible about their sexual behavior when they're older mm -hmm. because they could spread it so that's a very very good project that one and then there's the um what's that called from the family of god street boy shelter which uh -huh. also was started with the help that's something to point out this uh, this time now i'll just tell you most of these projects were started because of people willing to either give money like the couple uh, Sheila and John from Mogai or um, Louise Brown a Salvation Army volunteer with um, what you call that group VMM so the VMM volunteer wanted to help the street kids and I said well why not and the, the, the thing is as long as you've got funding you can do any of these things and by good luck we, we were able to get funding from uh, where was the first fund Mission Cara Yep, mm. Mission Cara got us funding and obviously my family and friends sold bungees for us. So when we had money, we can start these things and try and make them self-sustaining. But um, this uh, Street Boys project is wonderful because it brings the boys, invites them in off the street and gets them cleaned up off the glue, you know, the sniffing glue and they are trying to get them off that. And then we give them lessons every day to catch them up school wise and then we give them good food and nutrition but not very not not fancy food just food because <laughs> we don't want them to get too comfortable and they don't want to leave us so we get them just basic food and uh, take care of them and give them counseling again and then go and see what why did they run away from home anyway and most of the time it's poverty which is easy enough to to address because you get the parents and night an income generating activity and then they can go back and um, do their do their work uh, for their family, um, but the ones where it's a, 
a man doesn't want the child of another man. That's harder. The kids are not wanted at all by that man and the mother can't say anything. She has to agree if she wants to keep her husband. So those are the ones where we look for foster parents and get them, try to get them um, home, other homes with their grannies or something. But it's, it's got a 75% success rate and 25% go back to the streets, but that's as much as we can. It's quite a good, to me, it's quite a good rate, better than nothing, eh? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, what's the, um, what kind of challenges do you face, like, in uh, Kenya? You know, there's, I know there's, you know, um, some groups there like Al-Shabaab and stuff, do they, have they ever affected your kind of day-to-day -day running of things? No, no, not so much that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they, they, they would be more near the coast, uh, but in Nairobi as well, there was bombs and all that, but we've never had anything like that. But what we, had, we do have is a terrible uh, tribal problem mm -hmm. where they, they hate other tribes. Right. And um, that's that's a terrible... That, that, in fact, 2007, 2008, we were involved in the middle of the, the terrible um, uh, post-election violence. And oh. I'll have to say here now to cl clarify the record, the, the, the media got it wrong. They, they made up stories that we were surrounded by armed thugs and we were going to be killed. That was rubbish. And I, I was on BBC telling them and I told them it and they didn't want to hear it. But anyway, I told them, I said, your report, I got that wrong, I said. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, it was not true, but the, the houses were burning all around us. But ours was, the convent was untouched because we were a refuge for people to come. The, the church and the convent was where people came to to seek refuge because their houses obviously were getting burned. But it, and there wasn't that many deaths in our place, not like Elderet and, and other places where people were being murdered. The most we saw deaths were the police shooting the young boys who were burning houses. They shot them point blank dead and we saw their bodies in the mortuary. It was a terrible time. So I, after that, we went to, to find out more about the Focalari movement. Don't know if you know about them. They're yeah. absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Focalari movement has helped me a lot in my own personal um, religious life, but also to try and bring some idea of unity and love for others, no matter what, what um, nationality, what tribe, what colour they are, or what religion to make people realize that we're all God's children. And we went and found out about them so that we could try and help our people to, to stop this blind hatred just because you're a different tribe. Because this is what it can lead to, the politicians, and that's another problem. The politicians are corrupt, you know. Yeah. Um, a lot of them are just there for the money and they don't care about the poor people. So we also had to deal with that in public offices, bribes, police stopped me on the road, wanting a bribe but I used to manage to get out of it just by saying oh that's okay I says if you if I give you the money will you give me a receipt because I'm a sister I need to get receipts and they just go on go on <laughs> 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 they, don't, they don't want any money then <laughs> they don't want to deal with that do you, sister no. do you have any do you have any kind of one standout memory from from your time in Kenya oh my goodness one just one one or a couple? Or <laughs> what do you well, think? I'm trying to think which would be the most um, uh, standout memory. Oh my goodness. Um, do you know, just to think of, of when you're one of the memories, anyway, is just to be in the company of these children, yeah. the HIV positive kids, you know, mm -hmm. who know that they've got a, a life limiting um, disease, but with the ARVs, they, they can live a normal life. And then for them to get up, uh, visitors from our funders from America, Petfar come in and they stand up and give their witness. Honest mm. to goodness, I, I sit in, in tears just trip me because they are so grateful for their lives. You yeah. know, that the fact that they realise, young as they are, we're talking about 10, 11 year olds, 12 year olds, and they are telling these people, thank you so much for your funding, for your medicine you're giving us, because without it, we would be dead. <laughs> yes, that, yes. That, sticks, that sticks in my mind because so many times it happened, and no matter how often I heard kids talking like that, it didn't fail to move me, and I was just totally like a wreck, you know, <laughs> crying like that. But, I mean, that's, that's just part of the joy of, of being able to help them, you know. That's fantastic. It's really powerful. Mm -hmm. like you did, you know, yeah, a sort of situation. Um, I'm if really we talk to you here, I'm not nearly <laughs> 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 I mean, if, if we talk a wee bit about um, 
you know, being a missionary in, in, in particular, uh, what do you think the most important qualities or, or characteristics are that a missionary must possess? Well, uh, first of all, I would say you would have to be flexible. A missionary that's not flexible won't last long because when you go to a different place, especially on the missions, uh, when we call say missions, we mean foreign missions or, or the third world missions, um, you're obviously going to meet a lot of different things and things that can frustrate you and a lot of things that you just wouldn't agree with and you've got to more or less put up with it and figure a way out to cope. Mm -hmm. So flexibility, I would say, is number one. Yep. Faith, obviously, strong faith, you need a strong faith to know that what you're doing is for, for God's, is God's will and it's for God's glory mm -hmm. um, because sometimes you can get dead discouraged, you know. You, example, we had a, a, a let me see a few incidences of close uh, staff members who turned out to be dishonest, mm -hmm. trying to steal our money from from the to stop. You know the money it's used for helping kids. They would be wanting to steal it, but thank God most of the time it was only once or twice they got away with it. But we caught them and we were able to sack them, and that hurt, that hurts you know because you really think they're, they've got the same ideas as yourself that you want to help people and that you would never dream yeah. of taking the the, the 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 meal out of a child's mouth. But that kind of and these are people that were working as teachers. These were yeah. people we were paying as well. These were volunteers. But the teachers, the, the employees we had, they were getting good salaries from PEPFA. So it wasn't as if they were poor. In fact, the poor, I've yet to find a really poor person that would steal money. They might steal bread or food, but they wouldn't just get into your house and steal your money because they're so poor that they wouldn't even have the cheek. But the ones that have got something that they've got, they want more and therefore... They, they want to take the money that's meant for the poor because they don't see them as anything. That really is a challenge. That is a hard, hard. So you have to have faith that God, um, God is above everything and you've just got to forgive them, really, which is not easy. Um, another, you have a sense of humour. If you don't have a sense <laughs> of humour, you go mental. <laughs> Absolutely. Some of the things that happened and you just laugh because what else to do? you'd spend your life crying you know yeah. um sad sad things that happen as well scots people always say we, we make fun of tragedy because we can't really cope with it so we just make fun to 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 forget our troubles so i don't know if it's a true statement but it's usually what we do to cope yeah terrible sad things in terms of like the positives and negatives about being a missionary what would they be Okay, um, I think the positives, I think the positive is just that there's a simplicity to life there and there's not a lot of red tape. And we'll, although it's getting that way now, all these tax things now, you've got to fill in tax forms and if you don't fill them in, you get fined. And so, but it used to be very simple, a simple life, just like the countryside, nobody would bother you and yeah. you would go on with your life. Also, the way you can just start a project you don't need to go and get planning permission to do anything. Well, you actually do have to get planning permission to build. But if you want to start a project to help a group, you just get them and sign something and then you're off you go. Um, there's no big deal about it. Um, life is more, I think it's more less restricted in, in the missions and that's a positive. And also the way the people are so... I don't know if it's religious, not religious is not the word, spiritual, they're very spiritual people mm -hmm. and they're very um, attached to their church, they love their church and they love their priests and I think the, the numbers that come to church, that's a positive and the, the joy at mass, everybody dance, I love dancing, so dancing at mass, man. in <laughs> fact even here I forget where I am sometimes and I'm starting to move a wee bit, my sister starts dunting me, She's, I'm not <laughs> Africa now, you know, so that, that is that is a joy, a total joy to celebrate the Mass rather than just going to Mass and standing there and enduring it, which really I would say is a big problem here. People go and they, they kind of just look so sad. I look about me and I want to say, look, Jesus is risen, by the way. But they're just maybe praying or something. I don't want to judge them, but it's yeah. like people don't, they don't, they're not African, so that's why. So when African music's in their blood and they're moving every... Um, everything's music and everything's singing and they're just joyful so I think that's what I miss most having said that there's good wee masses here the wee folk masses I like them <laughs> um, so that's that um, 
Yeah. That's about it. The negatives now, um, as I say, the corruption is quite hard to take. And also um, asking people asking for, for help all the time, yeah. which is really understandable. Yeah. But the ones who ask, we found out that actually they're not the most needy. In fact, they're not even needy at all. They've maybe got something, but they want to ask because they want to take advantage of you. So you don't know if they're your friend because of uh, friendship or because they want to see your white person, you might have money. So we just have a policy that we don't give personal, we don't give individuals, they have to go through the social work to establish if they're needy or not. Example being, the, the, went, the social workers went to a house and no, the Orphans and Vulnerable Children group went to a house and there was nothing in it, just a wee mattress. Mm -hmm. And the wee child tugged at the, the shirt of this woman and she said, do you want to see our other house? <laughs> so she said, all right, well, so around the back and this house, so, uh, the big sofa, uh, chairs, uh, armchairs, TVs, videos, everything. And we nice we crochet things, and that was them wanting a, a mattress off of us, and yet they were they were well off. Yeah. So that gets your that gets in your goat, you know. That's not yeah. very pleasant. But other than that, I don't think there's many other negatives, to be honest. <laughs> and, and sister, uh, what what does the term the term mission mean to you? Okay, so to mission always to me um, we used to talk about mission missionaries missions. It was always about um, abroad, foreign missions, yeah. going to rough places. But the more I live, the more I see mission is what every single person is called to. And that's just to, to let Jesus into their life and let Jesus do his work through us, just to be instruments. If you excuse my Franciscan instruments of your <laughs> peace thing, but that is exactly to me, what we are actually called to do, mission in every single country that we find ourselves, lay people as well, everybody, you know, nobody left out, uh, every, all Christians, I guess, and maybe even Muslims have got the same idea of helping to spread that idea of the, 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 the brotherhood of man, the, kind, the kindness of humanity to humanity. So it's like um, this war now in, in uh, Ukraine, everybody's criticising that why why um, is it just a big deal about Ukraine? Not everybody, but people are saying well, there's war. And it's true, there's wars going on in many countries. But I think people here, especially in the West, we are seeing ourselves in those people. Yeah. Because other, otherwise, it's like, oh, those wee Africans, they're used to it. They're used to it. They don't, they've not got many houses anyway. When they get displaced, they can go and build another house in a half an hour. You know, that's what people can think. And yeah. it's true, they do They do have a lot of suffering in, in Africa and they're used to it, but nobody should be used to war. But when they look at Ukraine, they see people that look like your granny and your wee sister and your mammy. They see that and they say, oh my goodness, that could be us. And that's maybe touching them. So if we could get that spirit for everything, for everybody to see those people are hungry, that could be me even if they're Africans yeah. or they're Asians, whatever, is to make people aware that we are responsible for each other, no matter where we are. And I think, I think when you were, mission. yeah, I think when you were talking about your uh, brother uh, Bernard Taylor on, I think <laughs> we can probably classify him as a lay missionary. Um, <laughs> and, and you were talking, you touched upon that there, and how do you think lay people can be missionaries and, and what's the best way that they can live out their mission? Well, obviously, to, to me, the, the, the way that they live their, their own um, calling, their own Christianity mm -hmm. um, around them. Mother Teresa said something about get one piece on earth, start with your own family. So the, the family's uh, unit to, to sort of love your own family and then yep. bringing your kids up to be loving people, they'll go out and they'll influence their friends and everybody then passes, it becomes like a, a contagious thing where everybody um, is nice, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I, know. I used to think I was the naive person that thought everybody had a loving family. And I got my eyes opened wide in Postle Park, where yeah. a wee boy went up to a wee lady's house to say, a wee blind lady, by the way, who had not a, hardly a stick of furniture in the house. This is Postle Park. And he asked the Mrs, can I walk your dog? And she went, Oh, that would be good. Um, because he's not been out for a while. She lets him in the garden, but she, anyway, he took it and stole it. Oh, it's like, I couldn't believe it. I said, what did you look like? As if I was going to go and hunt him down. But I was so angry. 
And yeah. I just thought, what kind of parents does that kid have? And then yeah. you hear a terrible, terrible things happening because people are not brought up with Christian values or decent human values anyway, never mind Christian. So I think yeah. that's what, what uh, the whole thing's about, you know, it's the uh, way people live in their practicing their faith, practicing their love and their, their their religious values, and maybe thinking of others by doing a wee bit in the soup kitchen, volunteering here, volunteering there, yeah. and giving, obviously giving to mission uh, appeals and stuff mm-hmm. so that they can share some of their good fortune with others. Mm-hmm. And just, yeah, and just to touch on that as well, um, obviously you spoke earlier on about, you know, Missile Scotland helping out in Kenya and things like that. I mean, why... I mean, there's lots of charities out there, but why, why in particular, do you think it's important to support the work of Missile Scotland and, and its kind of partners in the, the Pontifical Mission Societies? It's because it's Catholic, you know? It's yeah. a Catholic, um, um, what would we call it, um, established Catholic uh, organisation where we know and we believe that the money will be going to good use. A lot of people don't give to like Oxfam in those places. Not, I don't want to use that word now because I don't want to say that there's been on the news people saying that they use most of their money for administration and they, they say they'd rather give it straight to, to even Skiaf. Now they give it to Skiaf, they give it to, to Missio mm-hmm. because they know they actually know the people like we know you yeah. for example we yeah. know sister stacy and we know that you're not people that are just going to pocket the money and run away so it's like people want to give where they know their money will be most useful you know so yeah. that's why i would say missio is is a, a, a reputable organization yeah. mm-hmm. and finally what, what we usually end on is a wee kind of light-hearted thing and it's to tell us something about yourself that maybe other people won't know now i think based on some of your social media people know that you're a green up morton fan so that's something that we do know tell us something about yourself that we don't oh my goodness me <laughs> well i'll tell you but i'm not doing it right i'm not doing it on this this forum but i do doris day impersonations oh wow with a with a wig, with a blonde wig <laughs> and a big hat. <laughs> where, where have you done these? We always at parties when I was in Kenya. We always had parties for different things. In fact, mm. we used to have a party if the sun went up in the morning. No, we did. I like parties, obviously, but I would have a party for sisters getting feast days, sisters' birthday. Not birthdays, but just we do feast days instead of birthdays. But even we celebrations for um, Easter, Christmas, we'd always have some sing songs. And I've taught the sisters that we Annie had a yo yo. And the <laughs> Kenyan singing me, Annie had a yo yo. They love it. They love it. And they want to sing it again and again. So I was fed up listening to it. So, um, I, no, I just, I, I, I actually thought, well, somebody said to me, you should have been on the stage, the one that left five minutes ago. <laughs> That is amazing. Which year, which year, uh, which year party pieces then from Doris Day? Well, uh, well it's, uh, once I had a secret love. Right. <laughs> I'll sing it for you one day, Jennifer, just you and me. This is, when we were doing the article on you a wee while back, why did the, why did these photographs not appear? Well, they are classified. <laughs> and we <laughs> oh, to God, we had some good, good fun, good parties there. <laughs> oh, that's absolutely magic. Sister, thank you very much for your time. It's been oh, really sure. illuminating to find out even more about your time spent in Kenya and, you know, your journey towards um, being a sister itself. And... Mm. I hopefully will catch up with you again very, very soon. But thank you very, very much for your time. Right. Well, if ever, ever you're in Rome and I'm still there, you can come and visit me, all right? Absolutely. And then we'll have a, another wee party. That's but I don't know what I've done with my wig. I think I've left my wig in Kenya. Well, you'll, need to, dig, you'll need to dig it out. I I'll to make this. another one because that was <laughs> getting a bit crawly, you know. It was like, <laughs> and yeah, my head was itchy, mate. <laughs> but anyway, it was lovely talking to you too, Gerard. You too, sister. All right. Take care. God bless. Thank all you. right. Bye bye. Right. Take care, too. Bye. Missio Scotland is a Scottish branch of the Pontifical Mission Societies, the Pope's official charity for overseas mission. To learn more about the work of Missio Scotland, you can visit our website www.missioscotland.com. You can like us on Facebook www.facebook.com slash Missio Scotland. You can also follow us on Twitter Missio underscore Scotland and on Instagram Missio Scotland. If you would like to donate to Missio Scotland, visit www.missioscotland.com slash donate.
You can also call us on 01236 449 774 or send donations to Missio Scotland, 4 Laird Street, Coatbridge, ML5 3LJ. Please keep us in your prayers. Thank you and God bless.